Beloved brethren, we shall now pray. Dear Father Yahuwah, our Almighty God in heaven, we thank you, dear Father, for all the blessings that you have showered upon us. We thank you, dear Father, for always keeping us safe from any harm and danger in this world. First of all, dear Father, we'd like to ask you to please forgive us for all the sins that we have committed. Yes. May you please cleanse our hearts and our souls, dear Father, so that as we approach you today in this holy gathering, all of us may be worthy upon thy most holy sight. On the next part of our gathering, we are going to study your holy words, dear Father. May you please grant unto us the knowledge and understanding so that all of us may fully comprehend the teachings that's going to be delivered to us today. And may you please bless our brother whom going to lead us today in this holy gathering. May you please grant unto him the knowledge, wisdom, and the power of the Holy Spirit, so that all of us may be strengthened in our faith. May you please also bless the offerings that we set aside, dear Father Yahuwah, so that they may be used to all of his endeavors. And we beg of you to please bless the, li the livelihood of your people yes. so that not only we are able to, to sustain our daily needs, yes. but also most importantly, so that we may be able to offer, to offer you offerings that is pleasing to your holy sight. Amen. Dear Father, we are firmly believe that you are hearing our prayers and that you will be with us today in this holy gathering yes. only in the name of our Lord, your son, Yahushua HaMashiach. Give the sacred words of salvation, gather all faithful ones. Let's proclaim with great adoration, praise his name, my To our God who reigns on high With His love He grants a redemption Through His Son, Savior, Yahusha Now we pray of His expression What a privilege to carry May He find us Righteous and just Giving glory Beloved brothers and sisters in the faith, this part of our worship, we will feed our souls once again with the words of God. What we are going to discuss today and learn is about marriage. Marriage based on Yahushan values. For us, followers of Yahusha, Marriage is much more than a civil contract with legal benefits. Marriage is essential to God's plan for the people he created. The Bible teaches God's expectations regarding marriage and he gives Practical relationship advice. Marriage is an eternal concept because the one who established and instituted it is our eternal father, Yahuwah. Marriage is meant to be a loving, intimate, selfless, selfless, relationship between a man and a woman that lasts through eternity, as people say. Now, what is Yahuwah's purpose in instituting the union between a man and a woman or between a male and a female gender? Let us read what the scriptures has to say. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and then chapter 2, verse 18, and then 21 to 22 of chapter 2. Let us read. So God created man in his own image. 
in the image and likeness of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Now the Lord God said, it is not good, sufficient, satisfactory, that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, suitable, adaptive, complementary for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs or a part of his side and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib or part of his side, which the Lord God had taken from the man, he built up and made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. So beloved brethren, what is Yahuwah's purpose in instituting the union between a man and a woman, or a male and a female? Well, according to what we have read, Yahuwah instituted the union between male and female gender, man and woman. He instituted marriage for the happiness of the man and the woman that he created. What proves that? Well, according to what we have read, God said it's not good for a man to be alone. It is not good for a man to be lonely. Being alone, we will be lonely. So what did God do? He created the woman. How did God create the woman? Well, according to what we have read, he made Adam fell asleep. And then when he caused him to fall into a deep sleep, then God took one of his ribs, part of his side, and placed up the with flesh. And then that rib or that part of his side, which the which the the creator took from him, he built it up and made it into a woman. And then he brought her to the man. That's the first marriage. That's the first marriage that God instituted. For the happiness of man and woman whom he created. That's the purpose. Now, what is the first and greatest ingredient of a successful and a happy marriage? Let us read Ephesians 5, 25. And then we'll read Titus 2, 4 to 5. And then we will read Ephesians 5, 33. Husbands, love your wives. The same as Hamashiach loved the church and gave his life for it. By doing this, they will teach the younger women to love their husband and children. They will teach them to be wise and pure, to take care of their homes, to be kind and to be willing to serve their husbands, then no one will be able to criticize the teaching God gave us. That's in Titus 2, 4, 5. But each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And a wife must respect her husband, Ephesians 5, 33. So what is the first and greatest ingredient of a successful and a happy married life. Well, according to what we have read, the Apostle Paul clearly stated that love and respect coming from both sides, coming from both parties, husband and wife, male and female, who engage themselves into marriage, is the greatest ingredients of a successful and happy marriage. Love. Love in marriage, beloved brethren, can be deeper and more selfless than in any other relationship. It is this type of love that Yahushua, our Lord, expects of his followers. And it is the virtue that couples need the most to be observed at all times. Why? Because this is how husband and wife will learn how to be wise and pure, how to care 
for their homes and how to be kind and willing to serve each other for the happiness of their entire family. And most of all, as the scripture said, no one will be able to criticize God's teaching if the husband and wife base their relationship on love and respect towards each other. Now, what does Yahuwah require the man and the woman if they decide to enter married life? Let us hear what is written in Genesis chapter 2, verses 24, and then chapter 1 and verse 28. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. In this way, two people become one. God blessed them and said to them, have many children, fill the earth and take control of it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air. Rule over every living thing that moves on the earth. What does Yahuwah, our God, require the man and the woman if they decide to enter a married life? Leave their father and mother and be joined together with their spouse. They are no longer two, the Bible said, but one flesh. Coming from those who studied how this relationship works, says Married couples are meant to be unified in every possible way. Do we believe that? We do. Because they are already one. So married couples are meant to be unified in every possible way. We agree with what these people are saying. Now, one of which is actually sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is an expression of love. What does it bring? It brings happiness. What else does it bring? It brings unity. Where does it bring happiness and unity? Into a marriage. It is also the power by which married couples or the husband and the wife can multiply and replenish the earth as designed by Yahuwah, as instructed by Yahuwah. Have many children. Intimacy is a blessing that can lead to the incomparable joy of children as part of the eternal family unit designed by Yahuwah our God. Therefore, when God instituted marriage, he did not only institute it for the happiness of God. That's the number one ingredient. He instituted it for the happiness of man. But he will also create more human beings through that marriage, through that husband and wife intimate relationship. They had to create family. So God, Yahuwah God, wants to have husband and wife, not only a spouse, but a family. Children, it's a blessing that God is giving to a husband and to a wife. Now, how did Yahusha emphasize the greatness of love in a relationship? Let us read here in John 15, 13, 14. The greatest love people can show is to die for their friends. You are my friends if you do what I tell you to do. How did Yahusha emphasized the greatness of love in a relationship. Well, Yahusha Hamashiach taught greater love had no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Beloved brethren, couples or husband and wife must learn a powerful lesson from this teaching. A spouse, as a spouse, you are expected or we are expected to essentially lay down our old life and sacrifice many of our personal desires for our closest friend, our husbands and wives. You know, your husband, your wife. 
the more we are able to put our spouse first and keep our focus on the success of our partnership, the stronger our marriage will be, as experts says. And actually, as the Bible teaches, the first sacrifice is when we leave our father and mother and live a life with our spouse. Just try to imagine. Go back when you were kids. Who do you trust? Who do you always want to when you were a child? When you are having troubles, when you are having problems, who do you go to? To your mother, to your father. See? And then we live for them for quite a long time. From our being a child, being a young adult, and being an adult, we live with them. Coming from school, we go home. We wait for our parents to arrive from work. And when they arrive home, we are so happy because we can see them again. And then the following day, we eat breakfast together. We do things together with our mother and our father. Now, when you are about to enter, when a person is about to enter a married life, that's the first sacrifice. You are no longer to be with your father and your mother. You're going to leave them and you will, we will certainly going to dwell with our spouse. That's a sacrifice already. Now, what is another sacrifice a couple may do for the sake of a happy and a blessed marriage? Let us hear again what the scriptures has to say. In 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 4, GNT and AMP. A man should fulfill his duty as a husband and a woman should fulfill her duty as a wife. And each should satisfy the other's needs. A wife is not the master of her own body, but her husband is. In the same way, a husband is not the master of his own body, but his wife is. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, goodwill, kindness, and what is due her as his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have exclusive authority and control over her own body, but the husband has his rights. Likewise, also, the husband does not have exclusive authority and control over his body, but the wife has her rights. Now, beloved brethren, let us try to understand very thoroughly what was just said by the Apostle Paul to the early Christians in Corinth. So our question was, what is another sacrifice a couple or a husband and a wife may do for the sake of a happy and blessed marriage? What we have read is the testimony from Paul. We had to surrender our right to, to our own body to be given to our spouse. Remember that, beloved brothers and sisters in the faith. Most marriages are founded on love, but it is choosing to maintain and grow that love that can be the challenge. That is where commitment comes in. Now, Yahuwah, our God, considers marriage to be an agreement between a husband and a wife. That's why you sign a piece of paper, right? That's an agreement between a husband and a wife, as well as a commitment or agreement between the couple and Yahuwah. Yahuwah expects us to dedicate ourselves to the relationship and to recognize our responsibilities. What else? Our duties and our loyalties, both to our spouse and to our God, Yahuwah. Now remember, this body that I thought is mine, does not really belong to me when I marry somebody. This body now belongs to her, and her body now belongs to me. 
That's the way it was designed by God. So sometimes our spouses are telling us, hey, don't do this to your body. Eat right. Well, she has that right because that body is hers. I don't want you to get sick. I don't want that body that belongs to me that she was actually saying to get sick because that's mine. And you the same way, beloved brothers, can say that to her. Take care. Don't eat too much too. Take care of your body. He, I fell in love with you and I fell in love with that body too, with that person. So take care of that. Now that you marry me, that's mine. Now that I married you, his body now is yours. So we keep it clean. We keep it good. We keep it nice. We keep it healthy for the sake of that agreement between us and Yahuwah, our God. Now, how does the scripture teach us how to do exactly that instruction? Base it. Base everything on love, beloved brethren. Do we love God? Then we must always make certain that we respect our commitment with him as husband and wife. We have a commitment with Yahuwah. We have to take care of each other. We have to keep the love for each other. We have to make certain that we do our part in that agreement of marriage. Now, why is it necessary for husband and wives or for couples to have their marriage founded on love? Why? Why is it necessary? Let us hear what the uh, scripture says. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, have fervent and unfailing love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. It overlooks unkindness and unselfishly seeks the best for others. So why is it necessary for couples to have their marriage founded on love? Well, because that is where long-lasting relationships are founded. Marriage can require hard work, but remembering that it's founded on love gives us direction. You'll make mistakes. I'll make mistakes. We can make mistakes. Our spouse will too. Be patient. Be considerate of each other. Take on the hard times in your relationship with long suffering for bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace as what the Apostle Paul reminds. Recorded in Ephesians chapter 4, 2 to 3. It's not on your screen, but please read that. It says, with all humility, forsaking self-righteousness and gentleness, maintaining self-control with patience, bearing with one another in unselfish love, make every effort to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bond of peace, each individual working together to make the whole successful. So a husband and wife are individuals, but they are now whole. They are now one. So keep the unity. Keep the love and make the whole, you and your spouse, successful or your married life successful. So love is necessary because it can actually overlook unkindness. See, sometimes when you are in an argument, there is a harsh word that will be coming out from the lips of each and every one. But are we going to use that against each other and not talk of, of, of to each other anymore because we have already said some rude word to each other? No, because if we will all remember that marriage actually requires hard work, but if we remember that it is founded on love, it will give us direction which way to go. The direction. It's not, oh, I'll divorce you. I, we don't have anything in common. No, we have to separate. And that's the way people act when they are not happy with one another because love was already gone. Because in the first place, they did not base their marriage on love, on God's purpose. 
That's why we do not agree with that arranged marriage by parents. It should be you who will fall in love. See, God gave us a choice. Individual people will, must have a choice of his own. But God is telling us, you know, choose between life and death, or between happiness and loneliness. But I, I rather suggest you choose life. You know, I put before you life and death. Choose life. I put before you happiness and loneliness. Choose happiness. I put before you hate and love. Choose love. That's what it meant. We have that choice. So choose a partner that you want, that you will love. Seek it. Seek her or seek him from God. Ask God if she or he is the right one. Base everything on what God designed marriage for. He designed it for, for the happiness of people whom he created, and he's designed it also for procreation. Now, what blessings will Yahuwah pour to couples whose relationship is founded on love? Because they have understood why it was established or instituted by Yahuwah in the first place. Let us read what the scriptures has to say in Proverbs chapter 24, verses 3 to 4. And I guess I believe you can also read it. Through skillful and godly wisdom, a house, a life, a home, a family is built. And by understanding, it is established on a sound and good foundation. And by knowledge, its rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So what blessings, beloved brethren, will Yahuwah pour to couples whose relationship is founded on love? Because they have understood why it was established or instituted by Yahuwah in the first place. According to what we have read, our family will be established on a sound and good foundation. Wisdom, through skillful and godly wisdom. What is the wisdom? Marriage, God is giving us today. I instituted that. That's what God said. For the happiness of the man and the woman whom I created. I instituted that to procreate another human beings. But sometimes, you know, there are those who were not given that blessing, but God recompenses in a different way. Because there are some who were not able to have children. They were not able to establish their family. So how did they actually uh, solve that situation? They asked God to give them someone to care for. You see? And then they considered that person whom they had taken with them as their own child. Adopting. Some people are doing that. Is there anything wrong with that, beloved brethren? No. For whatever reason God has, and he did not give some couple as a child or children, God in a different way will recompense that, provided that the couple will ask God for what they need so that their life will also be happy, although they were not able to have children of their own. See, our family, according to what we read, it is based on love. Sometimes family is husband and wife only, and a dog sometimes, right? And sometimes uh, husband and wife and their relatives or their siblings' children are their children too. That's a family. When it's a family, when a marriage is based on that love that God actually Put as an ingredient, the, the best ingredient of all, whatever it takes. The husband and wife will always be together. They will always be established on a sound and a good foundation, which is love. There will be life in their, in their partnership. There will be home. That's home for them. And that is their family. 
you know, sometimes we do agree that family does not actually like just blood family. Your friends is your family. Okay? And many of your siblings' children is your family. May we always remember this, beloved Bridget. Marriage is a sacred thing for Yahushans like you and me. We do not joke about it. We take it seriously. Now, what will our children be if we base our relationship as husband and wife and wife on, on love and respect as God designed it to? Let us read here in Psalms 127, 3 to, and 5a. Children are a gift from Yahuwah. They are a real blessing. The sons a man has when he is young are like arrows in a soldier's hand. Happy is the man who has many such arrows. So what will our children be if we base our relationship as husband and wife on love? The children, not only in love, but also respect. Children, according to what we have read, are a gift from Yahuwah. It's a, the children are real blessings. Some of you will be having your child. Some of you already have your child or children. That's a blessing. That's a gift coming from Yahuwah. And you'll be happy if you have many. Not too many, though. You can have many if you want, but make certain you can provide because you will have a responsibility when Yahuwah gave you that kind of gift. So, children who are real blessing to the parents, for they are gifts from Yahuwah. So, the children who are gifts from Yahuwah are the real blessings from Yahuwah. For they have founded the relationship on Yahuwah's foundation, which is love. The parents were able to teach their children how to love first Yahuwah, to recognize who created her or him. The parents should teach that to their child or to their children. Teach our children how to love too. That's not only the foundation of marriage, that's the foundation of everything. That's the greatest. Love is the greatest. Because God, Yahuwah God, is love. That's why they need, our children need to learn about that. So, what kind of children will be a blessing to the parents? Let us hear what the Apostle John wrote. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my spiritual children are living their lives in the truth. See, that's what the Apostle John said. He was not talking about his children in the flesh. He was talking about his spiritual children. Now, it's also children. And we do have our spiritual children. And at the same time, our spiritual children are also our children in the flesh. Right? Because we raised them actually to know our God. So, that's also our... Our children are also our spiritual children. So what gives us parents great joy when our children actually live a life in the truth? John clearly said his spiritual children gave him great joy because they are living their lives in the truth. Our spiritual children, or could be our children in the flesh, will certainly give us tremendous happiness when they are living their lives in the truth too. Now to live in the truth is to live in Yahushua HaMashiach. Why are we saying that? Because Yahushua HaMashiach is the truth. As recorded in John 14 verse 6. You can also read that, beloved brethren. That's why we are telling you which uh, book and which uh, chapter and verse to read. Yahushua said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth. And the real life, no one comes to the Father but through me. So Yahushua is the truth. So when we live a life like Yahushua, then we will be happy. And also 
when our children live that kind of life, then we will be tremendously happy. Children who are truly a blessing to their parents have the mindset of Yahushua HaMashiach. You know, there are people who are religious, they say, but they're not actually living that kind of mindset. But if our children live that mindset of Yahushua HaMashiach, we as parents will certainly going to be tremendously happy. Now, what kind of a child is Yahushua actually? To his parent, especially to his mother. Let us read Luke 2, 48, 52. This is a, uh, a, a time when Yahusha, you know, did not ask permission from her, from his parents to go to the temple or to be in the temple. Let us read that. When they saw him, they were overwhelmed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been greatly distressed and anxious looking for you. And he answered, why did you have to look for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he had said to them. He went down to Nazareth with them. And here it is was continually submissive and obedient to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. Beloved brethren, what kind of a child is Yahushua, a Mashiach, to his parent, especially to his mother? Submissive, according to what we have read, and obedient to his parents. That's the mindset of Yahushua HaMashiach. Now, there are believers of Yahushua HaMashiach today. Do we have that kind of mindset? You as a child, do you have that kind of mindset? What's that mindset? Submissive and obedient to his parents. And respectful too. Yeah. He was respectful. He just explained to his mother why he was there. Don't you know? Did, why you need to look for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Because in the first place, you know, beloved brethren, they knew who Yahusha is. Who they knew. Mary and Joseph knew who their child is. Their child is the Lord. Their child is the Messiah. They know him in the first place. So the child, Yahusha, when the parents told him, your father and I have been greatly distressed and anxious looking for you. You know, as a parent, that's a reaction, isn't it? Well, I have experienced that in my life, you know, you know, to, to, in, in, a, in a moment to, to lose your child that you don't know where she went. It really gives you, like it distressed you, it, it, it made you anxious, so nervous. Where is my child? Where did she go? You know, that's why we can understand why Mary told Yahusha, why did you have, why, why, why did you do that? Why did you treat us like that? You did, you did not ask permission that you're going to go there. And then Yahushua said, why did you look, have you looked for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Because they didn't understand it for that moment. But Yahushua ensued that when, they, when he went with them to Nazareth, he continually, according to what we have read, be submissive and obedient to his parents. That is the mindset of Yahushua. Now, how did Yahushua show his love and respect to his mother when he was about to die? Let us read this part of the life of Yahushua HaMashiach. John 19, 26 to 30. When Yahushua saw his mother and the disciple whom he kept loving standing there, he told his mother, Dear lady, 
here is your son. Then he said to the disciple John, look, here is your mother. Protect and provide for her. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So how did Yahushua show his love and respect to his mother? When he was on the cross, about to die, his affection and respect for his mother was manifested from that cross. He was concerned about her care and well-being. What did he do? He gave this responsibility to the beloved Apostle John. What did Yahushua tell the Apostle John? He told John, John, look, here is your mother. Protect and provide for her. When Yahushua knew that he was about to leave her parents, and of course, his followers, when he was about to leave his followers, his parents, he told one of his disciples, John, protect and provide for my mother. That's the respect. That's the care a child with Yahusha's mindset will do when their mother is in need. There are religious, so-called religious people who say, I am a follower of Yahusha. I am a minister. What did you do your mother? Did you do that? I have, they sometimes claim, the mindset of Yahusha. You don't. Because unless you do this, when your parents are in dire need, then you have the mindset of Yahushua. Because what is being taught to us all the time? Have the mindset of Yahushua, obedient to God. Yes, that's true. It's in the scriptures. That's why we should have. We should be obedient to God. Isn't it also that it is a commandment to respect our mother and our father? And God even said that is the first commandment with a promise added, respect your father and your mother. Now, how did Yahusha prove that? He did not just say that. He proved that by telling his disciple, his favorite probably, John, take care of my mother. He is, she is now your mother. Mother, he is now your son. John now is your son. And he told John, protect and provide for our mother, for her. That's the mindset of Yahushua. Anyone who does not have that kind of attitude towards their parents are not of Yahushua. They are not of Yahushua. They're just claiming for their benefit, probably for their own profit. They will claim that they are Yahusha. They will claim that they are followers of Yahusha. That they are minister of Yahusha. Without this, you can have that kind of mindset. See? So, beloved brothers and sisters in the faith, now we know what kind of children will be produced by a marriage that is based on love. By a relationship of the husband and wife based on love, not based on anything else, not based on money, not based on power, not based on fame, but based solely on love, on God's design. Okay. So the children, like Yahuwah, like Yahusha, a child, was able to care for her. For his mother's well being, although he is not the one to do it himself, but he asks somebody to do it. Because he needs to do the will of his father. He must die on that cross. He did not just leave his mother, he actually 
has someone to take care of his mother. Now, is it the children's duty to care for their parents when they are about to go so, or when they are about to, to leave or when their mother or their parents grow old? Let us read. Here in First Timothy, this is what we can hear. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, see to it that these are first made to understand that it is their religious duty. Do you have a religion? Who is your religion? You say, and we say our religion is Yahusha. So we have to follow Yahusha. See, when it comes to treating our parents. See, first made to understand that it is their religious duty to defray their natural obligation to those at home and make return to their parents or grandparents for all their care by contributing to their maintenance. For this is acceptable in the sight of God. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them learn to practice godliness toward their own family first and to repay their parents for this pleases God. Is it the children's duty? Or obligation to care for their parents when they grow old and when they are about to go somewhere far away or let's say when they are about to get married well you have heard yes the answer is yes if a widow has children the bible said or grandchildren see to it that these are first made to understand that it is their the children religious duty to defray to defray or to provide money to pay a cost or expense their natural obligation to those at home and make return to their parents or grandparents. See, for all their care by contributing to their maintenance. Well, sometimes, you know, we can also use that. Are your parents having maintenance now? Because they are now old and sickly. They need to maintain some sort of medicine. You must help provide some monetary thing so that they can have it. And the scriptures you practice godliness toward your own family first. So you preach godliness to the whole congregation, but to your family, you are not practicing it. See? Our beloved brothers and sisters in the, the faith, what we are learning today is the values that Yahusha must have concerning marriage and also now concerning our obligation to our parents when they grow old. We are the fruits. Let us prove that we are the fruits of a marriage of our father and our mother that is based on love and respect and also based on God's instructions. Now, how did some family members care for elderly parents in biblical times? Let's find some story. I will be reading these stories. It's a little bit long reading. But these stories have something to do with what we are discussing today about taking care of our elderly parents. Well, let us read here in Genesis 45, 9 to 11, and then 47, 11 to 12, amplified version. Hurry and go up to my father and tell him, your son Joseph says this to you. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen, the best pasture land of Egypt. And you shall be close to me. You and your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds and your all and all you have. There I will provide for you and sustain you so that you and your household and all that are yours may not become improvised, impoverished. For there are still five years of famine to come. So Joseph settled his father and brothers and gave them a possession in Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses. Goshen, as Pharaoh commanded, 
Joseph provided and supplied his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the needs of their children. Now, beloved brethren, how did some family members care for elderly parents in biblical times? Well, Joseph lived far from his aging father. Why? Why was he living far away from him? We know the story of Joseph. Joseph was the one who can interpret dreams. Joseph can interpret dreams. Joseph was loved by his father, Jacob. Now, all of his brothers were envious of him. So his brothers tried to kill him. And when he, they were not able to, to annihilate Joseph, they sold Joseph to those who are what you call way back then merchants. And then Joseph was sold to the Egyptians. And then from there, Joseph was able to interpret the dream of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh, like Joseph from then on. And then the Pharaoh, who loved him, gave him that position. So he became powerful in Egypt. But when his brothers went to Egypt, because there was famine in Canaan in the land, they need to go to to Egypt, and Joseph show, saw them. They don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized them. So he asked for his father. And then what did Joseph tell his brothers? Hurry. Go up to my father. To our father, actually. And tell him, your son Joseph says this to you. I will provide for you and sustain you. So that you and your household and all that are yours may not become impoverished. For there are still five years of famine to come. And then Joseph settled them in the best land in Egypt. Goshen. We know the story, beloved brothers and sisters in the faith. Now what are we supposed to, to see? How Joseph actually treated his father. He cared for his father. He provided for his father. And not only for his father, but also for his siblings who did him wrong. Who did him wrong? But he did not retaliate. You know why? Because Joseph is a man of God. A man of God never retaliates. A man of God will not do evil for an evil thing. No but instead a blessing. Isn't it? That's what we have learned from Yahusha too. See, this is the kind of children we have. This is the kind of child we should be as followers of Yahusha, as believers of Yahuwah. Like Joseph. But there are people who are using the name of God but are actually acting like this. He doesn't help his parents. He doesn't help his siblings. And then he claims, I am man of God. That's a claim. But there is no showing of it. That's only a word. But that's the truth. It's a lie. See? Joseph, the, you know, fed the whole household, protected his father. See that? Joseph lived far from his aging father, Jacob. When Joseph was able to be to, 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 he arranged for Jacob to move closer to him. Joseph then housed, fed, and protected his father. He housed, he fed, and protected his father. His parent, the, the, the surviving parent. So, there are some who will ruin the house, destroy the house, don't let the food come in, and don't protect them, attack them. 
what kind of a, a son is that? What kind of a child is that? What kind of a daughter is that? When their parents are already old, they don't want to care for them no more. Hello, Yahushans. Believers of Yahuwah. We must adopt this kind of mindset. That's not the mindset only of Joseph. That's the mindset of Yahushua HaMasiyah. Now, who is another example in the Bible times or in biblical times who cared for her elderly parent? Not even his parent in the flesh. Let us hear this one. Ruth 1, 1 to 12, 14 to 18, and then 2 to 23. It's a long reading again, but it's a good story. Read with me. In the days when the judges governed Israel, there was a famine in the land of Canaan. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live temporarily in the country of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi. And his two sons were named Malon and Chileon. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went to the country of Moab and stayed there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left a widow with her two sons. They took wives from the Moabite women. So the two sons. Who were the two sons again? Malon and Chilion. They took wives from the Moabite women. The name of the one was Orpa. Not Oprah, or Pa, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and then both Malon and Shilion also died. So the woman, Naomi, was left without her two sons and her husband. So I imagine how sad Naomi was, right? At that point. Then she set out with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in Moab how Yahuwah had taken care of his people of Judah in giving them food. So she left the place where she was living. Her two daughters-in-law with her and they started on the way back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, return to your mother's house. May Yahuwah show kindness to you as you have shown kindness to the dead and to me. May Yahuwah grant that you find rest, each one in the home of her husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud. And they said to her, no, we will go with you to your people in Judah. But Naomi said, go back, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Go back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. Then they wept aloud again, and Orpa kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Then Naomi said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Turn back and follow your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. And your Yahuwah God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May Yahuwah do the same to me as he has done to you. And more also, 
if anything but that separates me from you, when Naomi say that Ruth was determined to go, when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So she stayed close to the maids of Boaz, cleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, beloved brethren, who is another example in Bible, biblical times? Who cared for her elderly parents? Not only her parents did this time, but her mother-in-law. It was Ruth. Ruth migrated to her mother-in-law's country and worked tirelessly to care for her. You saw this? You heard this story? So you married somebody. What does it mean? You married somebody. Her mother is your mother. His mother is your mother now. Her father is your father. And his father is your father. So the respect you give your mother and father in the flesh is the same respect you must give to your in-laws, your the mother of your spouse. This is how God designed family to work. Unfortunately, there are some children, they did not base their relationship with love. That's why when time came that they need to care for their parents, they are no longer caring for them. They are hating their parents. They are hating their parents in law they're not caring for them anymore and they are also not caring for their siblings anymore that's the kind of family that we will create if we are not going to begin and end in the right way <coughs> based it on god's instructions <coughs> so beloved brothers and sisters in the faith May this encourage us to put more love amongst our relationship. Children or parents first. Those who will become parents, listen to what God is saying. Make certain that you base everything, your relationship on love and respect. Because that is how we should do things. We should respect each other. And we should love each other. If we do it that way, then the ending of that family will be a good one. Because it is, it is founded on the right foundation, the greatest foundation of relationship, which is love and respect. Love of, to each other and most of all, love for God and for our Lord Yahushua HaMashiach. Make certain too that our children will learn the same thing, that they will have the mindset because that too is for your future. For the future of you as husband and wife, your children is your future. Because whether you like it or not, you are going to grow old. When you grow old, you will need things to help you out to continue moving on. And your children will be right there to take care of you, to provide things for you, for what you need. That will be a blessed life because God fulfilled his part and we fulfilled our part in that commitment or covenant with him in terms of marriage and becoming family. May we always be reminded of this, especially that the children who are listening to this only. Take care of your spouses. And take care of your parents when they grow old. Let us all rise for our prayer. Merciful Father, Yahuwah, you are so kind to us by reminding us of our duty 
our religious duties and obligations to you and to our parents and to our partner in life. To our children too. Thank you for reminding us of those religious duties. Father, please help us. Create in us humility and meekness that love will always prevail in our family, in every relationship, inside your holy church, inside the people whom you have chosen. Thank you, Father, for everything you have given us. Thank you for what we have. Thank you for our children. Thank you for our grandchildren. The duty that we have is to make sure that our children, our grandchildren will grow up learning these things. That's our duty to you. And we will not break the covenant with you. We will teach them about you. We will make them know you for the rest of their journey and not betray you and learn how to care for their parents when their parents also grow old. We firmly believe, Father, that you will bless everyone standing before you. You will bless every family of your chosen people. And you will continue to give us long life healthy bodies, and happy days of our life, that we may complete our journey, concentrating and glorifying your holy name. Please unite us always to the spirit and mind of our Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach, so that we will always be in unison with you. We ask all of this, Father, in the name of your begotten Son, our Lord and Redeemer, Yahushua HaMashiach. Amen. the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Yahushua HaMashiach, the love of our Abba Yahuwah, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of us today and forever. Amen. Hey, beloved brethren, it's the same reminders that we have. Let us continue to share our worship service via Facebook. Every time we, we do watch uh, these uh, registers or when we attend worship service live like this, you can actually share that live on your Facebook. Invite everybody, all your friends on your Facebook. And then uh, that will actually going to uh, land on somebody else's ear. And also we can share our website to others, churchofyahusha.org. And also uh, if they we want to donate, to make an offering, you can also go there and uh, look for that link offering. And if they, if our friends wants to donate for our uh, uh, cause, uh, for our foundation, opir.com, and they can make donations too. This concludes our worship service. And uh, before, I, before I forget, the 101 Berean Question Program is continuously airing every Thursday. And this concludes our worship service. May we all have a very good Sunday.